Northern Iraq, 2011, April. The three of us set out on a journey across northern Iraq from the safety of the Kurdish region across the Tigris River in the plain of northern Mesopotamia to the Jebel Sinjar or Sinjar Mountain near the Iraq-Syria border. The wide plain between the Tigris and the Sinjar just north of Mosul is still far from secure, but we have an important goal. The three of us speeding towards Sinjar come from different walks of life. <laughs> Ali is a Yazidi taxi driver from a Yazidi collective village in the Kurdish region of Iraq. Ali was born in a small village just on the banks of the Tigris, which was destroyed in 1985 by Saddam Hussein to make way for the Mosul water reservoir, the sea or Bahar for locals. Ali was then moved, along with his family, into a new village. They were soon joined by thousands of their Yazidi co-religionists when Saddam destroyed dozens of other villages to stop the inhabitants from supporting the Peshmerga, the Kurdish guerrillas fighting against his regime in the mountains. And he created huge, easily controllable collective villages in the late 1980s. As a young man, Ali sought work in Baghdad and Basra, but later returned to the Kurdish region and is now the main provider for an extended Yazidi family living in the collective village of Hanke. Wasfi, our cameraman, is a university-educated Yazidi whose family belongs to the emerging Kurdish and Yazidi middle class. A geologist specializing in environmental studies teaching at Zaho University, he could hardly be called a traditional or religious Yazidi, but he enjoys working as a cameraman even if it includes filming religious topics. And finally, a Hungarian researcher who has been carrying out research in the region since 2002. I have received much help in my research from my research subjects, the Yazidis of northern Iraq. I am especially indebted to Ali and his family, who have become my foster family in Kurdistan. <laughs> On this April dawn, we are setting out to hunt for the most sacred object of the Yazidis, the peacock standard, to film the ritual that Yazidis call the parading of the peacock. The peacock standard is more than a mere object. It is the symbol of the Yazidis. And the parading of the peacock is the ritual which most reflects both Yazidi history and the profound changes Yazidi community in Iraqi Kurdistan is going through at the present time. The Yazidis, a little-known people in a little-known land, Iraqi Kurdistan. Kurdistan, the region populated by Kurds, is divided among four countries. More than 5 million Kurds, a non-Arabic ethnic group, live in Iraqi Kurdistan in northern Iraq. 
Though equal partners of the Iraqi state on paper, Kurds were often repressed by the Baghdad government, leading to frequent armed clashes during the 20th century. Following the first Gulf War in 1991 and a failed uprising against Saddam, the international community established a Kurdish safe haven which eventually came to be known as the Iraqi Kurdish region. The new Iraqi constitution of 2005 declared it a federal state within Iraq, and as such, it enjoys considerably political and economic autonomy from Baghdad. Unlike the rest of Iraq, Iraqi Kurdistan is safe and prosperous. However, not all Kurdish inhabited territories belong to the Kurdish region. Territories along the border of the Kurdish region are contested between the Kurdish government and the central government. The same is true for Sinjar Mountain, a Kurdish-speaking enclave on the Syrian border where many Yazidis live. Yazidis are an integral part of Kurdistan and Kurdish history. They are a Kurdish-speaking people who follow their own religion. Though Yazidism is historically related to Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, it is so markedly different from these religions that there can be little doubt that it should be treated as an independent religion. Yazidis number perhaps half a million. They are Yazidis in Turkey, Syria, and the Caucasian states, but most Yazidis live in northern Iraq, where their religious leaders also live, and where their most sacred space, the Valley of Lalish, the spiritual center of the Yazidi world, is located. <laughs> Yazidis live scattered in the northern part of Iraqi Kurdistan. Roughly half of the Yazidis live east of the Tigris River in the territory controlled by the Kurdish regional government. Another huge group of Yazidis live some 200 kilometers to the west, in the Sinjar region near the Syrian border, surrounded by the Arab and Turkmen tribes of the plains. Isolated and rural, the Sinjaris are more devoted to the traditional ways in Yazidi religion than those living in regions more affected by technical, economic, and political development. Little is known about the origins of the Yazidi religion. Yazidi tradition traces the roots of their religion back to the first man and prophet, Adam. Modern educated Yazidis, and many Muslim Kurds as well, claim that Yazidism was the original Kurdish religion before the advent of Islam. Books or manuscripts cannot help us concerning the past of the Yazidi religion, as there are none. In fact, traditionally, Yazidis had no written books as their religion strictly forbade the writing down of sacred texts. The Yazidi religion was, until recently, transmitted orally. Kowals, the singers of the sacred hymns, played a crucial role in this. The schooling of Kowals took long years, and only a man with a prodigious memory could hope to be successful. Though men from certain other priestly castes can also learn some, or even many of the hymns and recite them, only the Kowals may play on their sacred instruments, the tambourine and the flute. Consequently, some rituals can only be performed when Kowals are present. 
During the centuries of oral tradition, it was the Kawals who were ultimately responsible for the survival of the Yazidi religion and Yazidi identity. Their activity ensured that Yazidi oral tradition remained more or less uniform instead of splitting into hundreds of local sects. Only the son of a Kawal may become Kawal and tradition demands that all the Kawals live in the twin villages of Bashika Bazani, just east of Mosul. From here, they have set out again and again to visit all the regions inhabited by Yazidis, from Armenia through eastern Anatolia, to the Yazidi villages near Aleppo, to sing the hymns, deliver sermons, keep religious tradition alive, take news there and back between center and periphery, and bring cohesion to a far-flung Yazidi community. Such visits have been part of a complex ritual referred to as the parading or walking of the peacock, for it is the peacock standard, the material symbol of all Yazidis, which actually goes on tour, accompanied by the kawals. The most sacred objects of the Yazidis, usually well hidden from the prying eyes of strangers, are the sanjaks, or standards of the peacock, bronze images representing the peacock angel. The peacock angel, who came into existence from the light and power of God, is the representative of God on earth and the leader of the angels. He is also the protector of the Yazidi people who follow his religion. His image, the peacock standard, was not made by human hands, but created by a miraculous power. As Yazidis are quick to point out, the peacock standard is worshipped as a symbol of the peacock angel, but not as an idol. Traditionally, there were seven peacock standards, each belonging to one of the seven districts where Yazidis lived from Aleppo to the Muscovy Sanjak in the Caucasus. Some of these are believed to be lost now. Each peacock regularly toured its own district in the company of Kowals. This is known as the parading or walking of the peacock, which had immense importance in Yazidi religious and communal life. Hardly any non-Yazidis have witnessed the parading of the peacock or even seen the peacock standard so far. Rules forbidding outsiders to see the most sacred object or to take part in the ritual have become more relaxed recently. But the peacocks are displayed only on special occasions. The Anzal peacock, or great peacock, is usually exhibited in the central sanctuary of Lalish during the Great Autumn Assembly when thousands of Yazidi pilgrims gather in the Sacred Valley. This peacock traditionally tours the territory roughly corresponding to what is today the Iraqi Kurdish region, where I usually do my research, so I hope to witness its parading. However, as it turned out, it has not walked since 2006. This left the Sinjar a far more traditional area where the ritual is still carried out despite the political, economic, and security troubles besetting this impoverished region. Traveling to Sinjar Mountain is not without dangers. The Sinjar itself is under the control of the Kurdish army or Peshmerga forces, whose frequent checkpoints provide relative security in the region, though occasional kidnappings of Yazidis still occur.
However, the road between the Kurdish region and the Sinjar is controlled by the Iraqi army and leads through territories rumored to be sympathetic to the Al-Qaeda. Though the situation had greatly improved by the spring of 2011, and many Yazidis passed safely back and forth between the two regions in daylight. Still, many worried that an obvious foreigner might prove too tempting prey for kidnappers. Life in Sinjar still bears the marks of the Saddam era. In the 1970s, Saddam destroyed all the traditional Yazidi villages of the mountain, some 160 of them, and moved their inhabitants into 12 so-called collective villages. While making modern infrastructure available, this also made monitoring the people much easier and prevented them from supporting the local Kurdish guerrillas. Yazidi's land was often given to Arab settlers, while the collective villages established on the plains suffered water shortages, making them unsuitable for agriculture. Loss of their traditional income made locals rely on the government provision system, and consequently on the central government for survival. After the collapse of the Saddam government, Yazidis started leaving the collective villages moving into newly built hamlets and villages of differing sizes and amenities. It was in such a new minuscule settlement, at the end of a dirt road, that we tracked down the peacock and its entourage. By the time we arrived, most of the rituals were over, and people were finishing the ceremonial meal that is a part of receiving the peacock and its entourage. The meal over, one of the kawals has to say the after-meal prayer. People may not get up and leave the room before he does so. <laughs> After the meal, the Kowals call out, Come and pay pilgrimage to the Peacock. And villagers duly queue up to pay their respects and give alms to the Peacock. The peacock standard is flanked by the two kawals acting as Sanjak Begi, or standard bearers. Kawal Hussein sits to the right and Kawal Bakir to the left. Kawal Hussein, still in his mid-thirties, has led a tumultuous life caught up in the political upheavals of the region. As a young man, he joined the Peshmerga, fighting against Saddam's regime. While at home, in between his traveling duties as a Kawal, he took part in attacks against Iraqi army and police bases. Until one day, while touring Sinjar with the peacock, he was arrested a captured comrade had given his name. He spent the next two years in an underground prison where he literally didn't see the light of day. These days he has withdrawn from politics and devotes all his time to his activities as a kawal. Small bars of sacred soil from the Valley of Lalish to the visitors. The Barat brings blessing, protects against all kinds of calamities, and can be found in every Yazidi household.
Some Yazidis even carry a brat with them for protection when traveling. Next to the koals sit two religious dignitaries also belonging to the entourage of the peacock, Sheikh Berkat, the Sheikh al-Wazir or minister of sheikhs, and his son Sheikh Hassoun. It was thanks to them that we were able to track down the peacock. As I have said, the Sinjar peacock is not easy to find. Most people in the Kurdish region did not even know if it would make the tour this spring, let alone know its schedule. We were near giving up on our plan to film the parading of the peacock when luck intervened. In the early spring, I went to visit the Yazidi festival of Sakra Jinn, Lord of the Jinn, in a mountain gorge just next to the village of Bozan. I had got the date wrong as the feast took place a week later. But at least, without a crowd of pilgrims, I could sit and talk with the family whose members are the guardians of all the shrines of Bozan. As it turned out, the head of the family, Sheikh Barkat, was a Sheikh al-Wazir, or Minister of Sheikh, one of the hereditary Yazidi religious dignitaries. And as the Minister of Sheikhs, his religious duties included accompanying the Sinjar peacock on its tour, together with his son Sheikh Hassoun. In fact, the peacock had started walking already a month previously, but the two men had briefly returned home, as Sheikh Barkat had to attend a meeting of religious leaders in Lalish. Contrary to my fears, it turned out that they liked the idea of having the parading of the peacock filmed, and provided me with the exact schedule of the peacock through Sinjari villages as well as a cell phone number. The idea of searching for the peacock with the help of such a device may sound jarringly modern, but it certainly came in handy when we had to track the peacock among the newly built nameless and tiny hamlets, especially as the torrential rains of the previous week, which had destroyed houses and roads and made travel impossible, also made the peacock run late on its planned schedule. After men are finished, the women and children come to honor the peacock. Men may come before the ceremonial lunch as well as after. In fact, they may visit throughout the stay of the peacock, but women come only at the end, when other rituals are over. Tradition changes fast as the whole community transforms. When I first attended the parading of the peacock in 2004 in another Sinjari village, the only woman given the privilege to come and visit the peacock was the wife of the host. According to Kowal Hussein, in the past in Sinjar, only men congregated to visit the peacock. Women felt ashamed, a key word in local culture, and stayed at home. Instead, one of the kawals went around visiting households with the sacred jar, which now stands next to the peacock. This jar was filled with water, and the kawal went from house to house, giving women a sip and sprinkling some water on the house. This water was called the water of pilgrimage and also the water from the White Spring. The White Spring being the primeval spring of Yazidi creation mythology. Sipping the water of the White Spring from the jar kept next to the peacock had the same merit as visiting the peacock itself. But times change and now women come too, though strictly only toward the end of the peacock's visit. When there are no more people queuing up, it is time to go. After a short blessing, 
Kawal Hussein starts to dismantle the peacock standard. The parading of the peacock was perhaps the most important ceremony of Yazidis for centuries. The political events of the last hundred years have changed that. Parading has long ceased in Turkey and the Caucasus. Not so long ago, the Great or Anzal peacock used to walk the central district in the Kurdish region three times a year. Not anymore. The last time it walked was in 2006. Nobody is quite sure of the reason. Parading the so-called Aleppo peacock in Syria stopped and started, stopped and started again. Kowal Hussein last accompanied it to Syria around 2007 or so. For the foreseeable future, there is no hope of sending it again to the Yazidis of that war-torn country. At the moment, the Sinjari peacock is the only one which is still regularly paraded, although only once a year instead of twice as in the past. The entourage of the peacock say goodbye and leave for the next village. I'm just telling you. Yeah, yeah, you okay. Know what uh, it's good you're telling me because. Uh, yeah, yeah. Anyway, it's right. uh, <laughs> As the koals form a procession, people line up to kiss the sacred instruments in the bag concealing the peacock. Inside, they set up the sanjak to the accompaniment of the music of the koals on the sacred instruments. After the music, Kawal Hussein recites a hymn enumerating Yazidi holy beings and holy places. <laughs> Once the peacock standard is set up, men come to make a pilgrimage.
The candlestick of Sheikh Shems and the sacred jar are set up in a different house, yet another site of pilgrimage under the charge of Fakir Hamid. Until finally, the three sacred objects are again reunited to the accompaniment of yet more sacred hymns, one of the central motifs of the parading of the peacock performed by the Kowals. The performance of the kawals is followed by a ceremonial lunch. Before people can start eating, Sheikh Hassoun gives a blessing. Such meals are an obligatory part of the ritual, no matter the time of day. <laughs> Playing host to the peacock brings prestige, but is an expensive gesture. The host has to provide a festive meal, not only for the entourage of the peacock, but also for all the visitors who come to make a pilgrimage to the peacock, which can be quite a crowd. Most people taking part in the ceremony today do not live here, but are members of the extended family or their friends who come specifically to see the peacock. The settlement itself consists only of four houses, and on normal weekdays, this small hamlet is nearly empty. <laughs> Most of the men from the four families who live here work somewhere else. As there are few job opportunities in the Sinjari region itself, they mostly migrate. Many work in the vegetable plantations of Rabia on the northern Mesopotamian plain. Some choose to become Peshmergas in the Kurdish army. Others work in the Kurdish region in construction or as waiters, sending their money home. This money is sorely needed as the villagers do not cultivate land or keep sheep. They claim that this piece of land is not fit for agriculture, while feeding sheep has become very difficult due to the drought which has plagued the region for years. Even many of those who had continued herding have been forced to sell their sheep in the past few years. The family of the man hosting the peacock does not even keep chickens for fear they would destroy the garden. A few square meters of parched land behind one of the houses with a few sparse plants. Everything indicates that the decades spent in a collective village relying on state rations have robbed them either of the skills or the wish for the traditional ways of making a living. The new ways of Sinjari economy are reflected in the living arrangements. The family still lives in a small mud house built in the traditional way. The big new house made from concrete where the peacock is received is waiting for the distant future 
to be finished and then the family will move in. Such new houses abound in Sinjar, most of them also built from Peshmerga salaries or from the remittances of those working in the Kurdish region. <laughs> The parading of the peacock costs money, not only for the host, but for all those who come on a pilgrimage to the peacock. Each visitor must put some money in the jar of the peacock. Some give only a symbolic amount, while others, reflecting on their social position in the community, make significant contributions. Some of this money goes to the koals and the religious dignitaries accompanying the peacock while the rest belongs to the Yazidi prince, the rightful owner of the peacock, making up a good portion of the income of the princely family. In the past, the parading of the peacock was an important financial source for the Yazidi emirate, headed by the princely family residing in the center. At the same time, taking the peacock around provided an important channel of communication and contact between the widely dispersed Yazidi villages and the central power embodied by the Yazidi prince and other religious leaders. The ritual is over. The peacock leaves the house to the accompaniment of the koal's music. something stuck in the car. Our third stop was the largest of the three settlements, a real village, though in fact it is inhabited by one single extended family with all the inhabitants related to each other. This village has its own school which the children of the two other settlements also attend. It is also connected to the electricity grid, unlike the other two hamlets, which have to make do with generators. The wife of our host in the second village thought this was because the third village was so much larger. But others argued that the reasons may be political, because the head of the third village belongs to the same Kurdish political party as the mayor of the nearby collective village, which is the administrative seat for this district. The yellow KDP flag and the Kurdish flag with the sun disk over the school and other official buildings proclaim the Kurdish identity and the political affiliation of the village. The villagers line up to greet the peacock and the koals. Inside, a peacock is being set up.
This time around, it is the other Sanjak Begi Kawa Bakir who sings a hymn listing Yazidi holy beings. The men of the village start making the pilgrimage to the peacock. Where are the kawals of the tambourine and flute? Kawal Hussein calls out, initiating yet another session of hymn singing. The hymn singing session is followed by yet another ceremonial meal. Kowals are sometimes forced to eat five lunches in a row, though this time Sheikh Barkat bowed out, claiming the frail constitution of a man of his age. The pilgrimage to the peacock continues. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Anti-smoking campaigns have not reached this part of the world yet. In the guest room, practically everybody but the peacock is smoking. Waspi, our cameraman, can no longer stand the smoke and leaves the room, thus unfortunately missing the first part of Kuwal Hussein's sermon. The sermon is a central part of the parading of the peacock, perhaps even more important than the hymns sung by the Kowals. The sermon, or mishaba, recited by one of the Kowals, touches on a number of topics connected with Yazidi beliefs, myths, and customs. It also contains moral exhortations to Yazidis on how they should live life. In our hectic days, sermons are not always part of the ritual. Visitors, preferably of high social standing, have to request and prompt the Kowals to give one. The sermons preached by the Kowals on these occasions are the only religious education and spiritual food many lay Yazidis were or are likely to receive especially in the case of those living far from the religious center. The parading of the peacock played a critical role in maintaining and preserving Yazidi oral tradition and through it, Yazidi religion. Though one cannot know it, seeing the rapt faces absorbed in the sermon of the Kowals, all this is slowly changing and disappearing. The Sinjar peacock is the last one to walk. The reasons given are manifold, but the demise of the parading of the peacock seems to indicate the end of tradition in a community undergoing rapid change. Religion and traditional customs are being eroded, especially where modern consumers society gains a foothold. Nor do the Kowals play the same crucial role everywhere as before. As immensely important as the Kowals have been in transmitting and keeping alive Yazidi religion, today their days seem to be numbered. General education has made literacy accessible to most young Yazidis and an emerging Yazidi middle class is striving to construct a religion based on written texts and taught in the classroom, just like the book-based religions of their Muslim and Christian neighbors. Books are gradually replacing oral tradition and their writers, who are school educated, are taking the place of kowals. In the past, kowals were also much respected as men of the world who traveled far and wide. Today, when travel has become much easier and migration an everyday phenomenon, this is no longer a source of respect. Economic hardships also contribute toward the diminishing number of kowals. These days, kowals, just like all other men employed in religion in Iraq, 
whether Muslim, Christian, or Yazidi, receive a state salary. However, this is only a small sum compared to the salary of other government employees. Kowals must support themselves from alms, which may be the traditional way, but it is uncertain and does not have the same prestige as a fixed salary. Kowal Hussein's brother, who also used to be a Kowal, has recently become a policeman instead, because of a policeman's much higher salary. The number of Kowals has dwindled to less than a dozen, and their future is uncertain. If this trend continues, with hardly any koals left, the peacock may one day stop parading, even in the traditional Sinjar region. Or even if it continues, it will change, becoming a mere memory of itself. As the clock nears four in the afternoon, Sheikh Berkat urges us to either stay for the night or leave right away. The roads of the Sinjar are not safe at night, so we heed their advice and start back on our way. The Kowals stay and continue their tour through the Yazidi settlements of Sinjar for another month. Their music, their hymns, their sermons, and their very presence, just as the sight of the peacock standard, reinforce the villager's sense of identity as Yazidis, the chosen people of the peacock angel. <laughs> Oh, yeah.